Welcome to the J-Boy Show, hosted by Jake Crane, the fastest growing sports show in the nation. I'm Coach Hugh Freeze. This is Super Bowl champion Brandon Graham. Hey, this is DJ Shockley, and you're watching. And you're watching. And thanks for watching the J-Boy Show. Hello, everybody, and thanks for hopping in again. Got another great episode for you today. Uh, very excited to welcome Josh Pate uh, from Late Kick and 247 Sports on to talk some SEC as the spring games are rolling. But first, want to give a shout out to our partners at betonline.ag. Head over there today. The online casino is always open. They never take a break. Uh, we got Major League Baseball, golf still going on, uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, just, they have bets on everything. If somebody's playing, you know, uh, uh, hockey in North Norwegian hockey, they've, they've got a spread on it. And they're going to play the Sharps to make you bet early. So head over to betonline.ag today. Uh, but without further ado, uh, excited to welcome, as I said, Late Kicks, uh, host of the Late Kick and 247 Sports, Josh Pate. Josh, what's up, man? Um, what Just top three all-time favorite Norwegian hockey players. Go. Oh, my, my favorite, I would say, number one would be Guten Tag. He was good. He was a wing. Uh, he, had that, he had that steroid deal, though. You know. Yeah, that. well, you know, it, there was – listen, they were never able to prove anything. He said it was a, a topical cream. They tried to say it was, you know, it's performance enhancers. But it's so cold over there. It, you got to be able to do something. Uh, I would say seconds probably Yager, uh, Mick Stojevic. Uh, he was a really good goalie. Uh, a third one, that's tough, Josh. Though. Who would be yours? Who would be your top, just top one overall well, Norwegian hockey players? See, the trick with Norwegian hockey, as I've told you once, i told you a thousand times, the R's are silent. So, so Yage is Yage probably my number one. True. That's true. Yeah, and past that, I don't – listen, I could go all day, obviously, on Norwegian hockey, so I don't want to get into it. Oh, I, I know. And, and, again, I know the people probably want to hear that more than anything. And, and we'll save that for the next episode. And, and we all enjoy what they do over there. And, and thanks to all our Norwegian listeners – uh, as well, but Josh, there's some other things, a couple things outside of Norwegian hockey uh, that happened this past weekend that, that people probably paid attention to. Uh, we have the spring games for Alabama, uh, Auburn, Georgia, and, and I know you're a guy that obviously keeps up with it uh, in detail. Is there a storyline, and, and you can only get so much from the spring game, but is there a storyline between the games we had this past weekend that uh, you, you're kind of focusing on, whether it's Bo Nix, whether it's the way Georgia looked? Uh, how much of a monster Darnell Washington is kind of what, what was your overall take? Well, I think we've got several programs now that are developing really good quarterback rooms. Uh, this time of year, I like to focus on the quarterback room. Sometimes you know, who's going to start. Sometimes you don't, but I'm not just looking at 2021 when I'm talking about your room. Mm -hmm. So case in point at North Carolina, they didn't have a game last week, but they are not all that dissimilar to Miami to LSU where we got highly touted guys coming in may at North Carolina, Garcia at Miami. Uh, we got Garrett Nussmeyer at LSU and they're coming in and they're not having to be pressed into starting action right away. The whole talking point, the entire offseason infrastructure around places like Oregon and Michigan has been, can Ty Thompson be ready? Can JJ McCarthy be ready? Well, they don't have to ask those questions, fortunately, at those places that we're talking about here. But I think it's really good. You know, Ohio State's like this on steroids, but it's really good to be having that conversation because I don't care if they're all going to stay. I know what history and now the future will indicate. But the point is, the ones who don't stay are leaving because they got beat out by someone better. So you're going to be OK. But I also think you could especially say this with Ohio State, but maybe some of these other programs, too. What we're seeing right now, especially with the proliferation of the transfer portal era, is fill in the blank, whoever you pull for. Your team's best shot at a national championship could very well be on someone else's roster right now in someone else's quarterback room. And it's impossible to do this. It's like a spider web. But think about 2024 and think about the current quarterback picture in college football. Jack Miller is in Columbus, Ohio, probably one of the 20 best quarterbacks in the country right now and will never be able to get on the field barring injury for them. Yeah. So it's kind of like Joe Burrow once upon a time not too long ago. Where in the world are some of these dudes going to end up that is not the current helmet they have on that's going to lead another program, maybe like a Penn State, just picking someone out of the blue? to heights that they have not seen before. That stuff right now is beyond fascinating to me. Yeah, and it's, you know, you always want depth and, and you bring up how crazy the transfer portal has been. And, and you're right. I mean, and you can go back even further. And obviously, as a coach, when you're looking at taking a, a transfer quarterback, especially a quarterback, you want a guy with experience. And, and while that not, uh, that may not mean it, it equated to a ton of in game on the field experience maybe he's got some but it's amazing what being in a room with a bunch of other elite quarterbacks you know you bring up ohio state that's a great example of that but you know one transfer quarterback jt daniel at georgia 
you know, and, and again, you can only do so much in a spring game, but Josh, I watched this guy and I think he really is the missing piece that Georgia hasn't had at quarterback. He looks unbelievably comfortable. He looks unbelievably organized and, and up front. I mean, Amarius Mims, you know, Sawyer, they should be pretty good, especially with Matt Luke coaching them. But Georgia just physically, Josh, looks like they really have a shot to do this. And if they don't this year, then I don't know when, when, they're, when they'll ever do it. Well, that second part, so I'm going to address that backwards. So the second part, I've heard people say that. I'm very hesitant to buy into that, only because I think from this point moving forward, they're going to have quarterback answer. Uh, once you answer that question one time, JT Daniels being the answer right now, and then the rest of the country sees – you play high-level quarterback and high-level offense, and you're in contention every year, people are going to come there. So they're not going to have a problem with quarterback at this point moving forward, which means I think they're going to have a shot virtually every year just by the fact of the roster that they're going to have. But with the one they have this year, here's what's really interesting. It's the first time since Kirby's been there that you enter the season where quarterback is not a question mark. And by question mark, I mean, can you win a national title with the guy? I think most people believe if everything else falls into place, Daniels is a good enough option to win a title with mm -hmm. but then I'm looking around and I can't remember the last time I said about Georgia the defensive backfield is a bigger question than quarterback maybe even parts of the offensive line a little bit bigger question than quarterback so different questions but still questions remain but I'm just telling you I said last night I'll reiterate it probably a thousand times between now and August if anyone's going to try and tell me that this Georgia team is going to fall short because of youth and inexperience in the defensive backfield. That's not something yeah. I'm ready to hear. That is yeah. not something I'm ready to hear from a staff with Kirby Smart on it, Dan Landing on it, Will Muschamp on it, just picked him up off a bus stop. He came in the room. That's not something I'm ready to hear, man. They, they, they got to get it done. They got to do a really good coaching job. They got to get it done. Yeah, and, and I'll say this. I'll, I'll actually answer that one backwards, uh, starting with the, the secondary. Now, we know they're young. We know they're talented. I like the speed kid. Getting the, the Tyke Smith kid from West Virginia is big. But the best way to protect a secondary that uh, may not be that experienced or you may think is not the strength of the defense is the defensive line. And they've got plenty of that. Uh, you look at uh, up front uh, from a defensive line standpoint, Georgia is going to be about as good as anybody. And, and that's because the way they've recruited, and it's really across the board. I think they're going to be fine at offensive line. That's how much respect I have uh, for Matt Luke. I think, you know, I, I think Georgia has had an unbelievable run of offensive line coaches. You look at Sam Pittman going to Arkansas and Matt, now Matt Luke coming back from Ole Miss and he'll be a head coach soon. But, you know, Josh, you, we say, or, or you say, well, Georgia won't have to worry about having a quarterback if, if they put on a good show offensively, you know, that they will always compete because they have unbelievable talent and they've recruited at such a high level. And that roster, Kirby does a really good job of roster management. But there's a litany of examples of teams that have had great offenses one year, a great quarterback, and then fell off the earth next year. You can talk about LSU last year. We can talk about Auburn with Cam Newton and then moving forward and Gene Chizik getting fired two years later. And there's multiple examples of that. So I think that's a harder sell, uh, but I'm with you. I don't think there's any excuses left this year because you are you should be good up front on the defensive line, and we know they're talented in the secondary. You know, my question to you, Josh, is, and we talked about this a little uh, the last time you were on here, but I really believe that Kirby Smart is going to take his, his – and I, I use this euphemism, and I don't want it to sound like he's just going to let, you know, Munkin do whatever he wants offensively without any – uh, say or anything like that, but I really feel Kirby may feel comfortable enough with not only JT Daniels, but Todd Munkin to really let the offense evolve, to be more of a shot oriented team to take, I guess you could say take more chances, but it's really not taking chances. If your quarterback's as prepared as JT Daniels. That is the key part. That last part you threw in there. I know that may fly over a lot of people's heads. So let's slow down. Let's say that again. It's not taking a chance when you got the right trigger man back there. Exactly right. So I know when we go back a year, people watched the opening of the season and they watched the middle of the season. They watched them get beat by Alabama, get beat by Florida. And everyone wanted to, well, not everyone. Let me not paint it with such a broad brush. Some people <laughs> wanted to criticize that they wouldn't open the offense up. Well, let me remind those of you who feel that way something. We just had the G-Day game this past week. Some of you may have watched it. The, um, the guy who started at quarterback for Georgia last year, you know where he is on their depth chart right now? He didn't graduate. He's not he, like he's still <laughs> on campus. He's not hurt. He's, I think, running three or four. Yeah, that's that's your starter from last year, which bleeds back into the main point. It was a massive risk to mm -hmm. ask that guy to do 
what you really want to do. Well, that's not a major risk. Yeah. In fact, it would be stupid not to ask JT Daniels to do everything you want to do. So I think Smart's looked around for a while. And really, even if it makes them uncomfortable, it's no different than Saban. They know what they need to do for the betterment of the team. Difference is Saban's had the right quarterbacks in there. Smart hasn't. Well, this he's at practice every day, okay? So yeah. he knows what he sees at practice even better than we know from a spring game. If he knows he's looking at the real deal at quarterback, I don't think there'll be any hesitation. Even if you have George Pickens, don't have George Pickens, man, great quarterbacks make some great receivers. They got all the athleticism in the world in that receiver room. You don't think Kyrus Jackson could pop on the national scene <laughs> with the right yeah. quarterback? You don't think Arian Smith could pop without the right quarterback? Oh, it's it's uh, th there's no doubt. And when you recruit at that level, and it's amazing, and you have great roster structure like we talked about. You never lose too much. You may lose a couple. Uh, you know, you look at Alabama losing uh, their best playmakers at receiver, but they got guys coming up from that. And and uh, it's going to be very interesting. You know, that Georgia-Clemson game, Josh, is to me that obviously the game of the, the week or the, the, the way to start it off, in my opinion. I can't wait. I'm taking the over. I don't care what it is. Uh, and I'm really interested to see. But I would not be surprised, and I said this yesterday on my solo breakdown, if Georgia – Took a shot first play of the year against Clemson. Would not be shocked at all if they took a shot. Uh, and I'm really excited to see it. But, Josh, I do want to transition a little bit. Uh, Auburn had their 8 day game. Alabama had their 8 day game. Let's start with Auburn. Uh, with Bo Nix, uh, to me, watching it looked fine under center, looked more comfortable. And, Josh, believe it or not, he threw the check down. I couldn't believe it. But watching Auburn go under center for the first play, run a play action, and throw it to a tight end, not on, not on a flute play or, or some crazy red zone play, but he was part of the progression. Uh, really lets you know it, it's kind of a brand new day offensively in Auburn. And, and they ran screens, but they weren't just bubbles. I couldn't believe it, Josh. Well, yeah, it is allowed under the rules of football. It is allowed. <laughs> so here's what, I, here's what I noticed. You mentioned the word check. I'll tell you what else they did in the form of checks. They let him make checks on yes. his own yes. instead of looking to the sideline and having an entire sideline full of cardboard cutouts and folks with headsets make, make his decisions for him. And so I think that more than anything mechanically, anything schematically, that's where they're trying to learn where Bo Nix is as a staff right now. And they're trying to put some stuff on his plate from the neck up that he, I'm not going to say he's been incapable of it. He's, it's been impossible because it was never an option for him. The previous staff just didn't do it that way. So he managed, there was also some differences in tempo. They allowed him to manage that. They allowed him to manage checks. And so that's good because my entire question with him has been how much do they have to deprogram or reprogram before they can start programming, start installing what they want in him and get him to be the quarterback they want to be for this system. But I'll tell you right now, they better, I, I think this now, and I've talked to some people who disagree, that's fine. I think they need to try and attack the transfer portal hard at yes. the receiver position oh, yes. in this offseason. Because yes. I'm telling you, man, it does not matter if Bo Nix makes a quantum leap. How in the world am I going to know it? if they can't pop the top off the defense and if everyone can sit there and squat on them an entire game and know there is no fear of paying any price for it. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, you know, you have Tank Bigsby, but you can't be one dimensional uh, and win in this league and, and in today's game. And you're exactly right. I'll, I'll do you one better, Josh. Not only do they need to go find a, a receiver or two, a legitimate playmaking threat, a legitimate, we have to shade to this guy. We can't let this guy beat us, which should open it up because they've got a cover. I mean, Javari Johnson should be a good player, Elijah Canyon, but they don't have that uh, elite guy, you know, a Seth Williams from, from last year, a, a Jamar Chase, somebody that puts the fear of God in you and opens up that running game a little bit, but they got to go get, I, they got to go get some tackles. I mean, I'm watching it. Josh, I watched this last year with the same guys. Rodarius Ham is a guard. Alec Jackson was sitting out due to, I don't know, rules violation, something. Uh, so you don't know how that's going to go. Neither one of the junior college guys, uh, Brendan Coffey or Killian Zarrea, have really stepped up. Brandon Council, who in my opinion is the best offensive lineman out of all of them, a guy that played every position last year before he got hurt, should be coming back. But we don't know, is he going to be 100% healthy? He had some really bad injuries that he had to come back from, and you never really know. They got to go get some receivers and some tackles. You're not, you can't play and win in this league with guards playing tackle that, that not only will the receiver room get you killed if they can't get open, but that'll get you beat even quicker. You know, anyone who follows Auburn has known that this was coming for about two and a half years. Everyone's looked at that receiver or not, not receiver. Everyone's looked at offensive line and they've looked at 2021 and they said, Oh boy, we better get this fixed before that year. Well, they didn't get it fixed. And so now you're left with this and it was going to be a huge problem. Even if Malzahn was still there. 
And he's the one who recruited all of them. So <laughs> you can bet your bottom dollar the first time Brian Harson walked in, he probably looked around and said, it's good to meet these guys, but where's the rest of the offensive line? Yeah. No, man, this is it. This yeah. is your O-line room. So here's the downside to this. This is not a shopping mall that's opening up mm. 30 minutes earlier than everyone else for you. That's not how the transfer portal works. Okay, first off, you are at the mercy of what's available. And then secondly, you're not the only game in town. You're not the only option. What they, their best bet right now is to probably look at the FCS or yes. lower tier FBS route. And you need to just go find guys because there are quality guys at the FCS level that could come up here and they could play dependable football. Okay, you don't have to have an offense. Or you, have, you don't have to have bulldozers on your own line. You got to have guys that aren't going to lose you games. Just find guys that give you a chance. And if you can do that, if you can have an average to above average offensive line product, then you can start to talk about what we got at receiver. Then you can start to talk about what could Bo Nix give us this year. But if you don't get that stuff answered, it's all irrelevant. No, I, I agree. Because, I mean, you – it starts up front. You can't protect the quarterback. doesn't matter how good the receivers or the quarterback is. And then you mentioned the wide receivers. They've got to go to the portal and get some guys. And you're right. You are at the mercy. I mean, it's supply and demand. And there's a lot more teams out there that will take a quality offensive tackle that need one than are like, no, we're good at tackle, uh, especially the, the higher level you go. You have to have depth at that position. Just look at the draft and how important it is. But speaking about taking chances, if you're struggling catching fish, you need to head over to monsterbass.com. It's not taking a chance. They have unbelievable lures, baits. It's a subscription service uh it'll show up at your door i just got mine i'm gonna bring it on the set got some top water uh got some jigs that i think are gonna work uh when we go out and attack the pond lake wherever you go fishing they, it's not just bass crappie all type of fish if it swims and it's and it's somewhere that you can see on a globe they're gonna have a bait for it not that you don't know what's going on but they're gonna know just as much and why not get a little extra help and if you use the pro promo code jboy10 so jboy 10 one zero you get 15 percent off your first box that's monsterbass.com head over there today and use that promo code here with host of late kick uh and uh, 247 sports representative josh pay josh having a lot of fun man i always appreciate you coming on and i do want to shift we've been talking about auburn alabama has their spring game as well and, and the biggest thing to me because we know alabama's talented josh uh we know they're talented uh, you look at Hall, you look at Xavier Williams, Slade Bolden's a guy that, that comes back, obviously Mechie as well in the wide receiver room. And, and, and we know they're bringing in talented guys that have even early enrolled on the offensive line. But do you think that the way Bryce Young, because I've got, and I talked about this yesterday on the show, I've got a theory about Bryce Young, something that he can't do. He's ultra talented. He's got a pretty quick trigger. Uh, he's able to scan the field. I think he does a good job in the pocket. And with Bill O'Brien, even though he did coach Deshaun Watson, he knows how to coach a dual threat guy. We all know the type of offense that he runs. But my advice to Bryce Young is you cannot be a running back playing quarterback. You are not Jalen Hurts. You are not that size. You cannot go take hits consistently and be able to make it through a whole season. Are you worried at all about Bryce Young trying to run too much? Um, if he does try and run too much, I'd be very worried about it. By the time they take the field in the fall, I don't necessarily know that that's the kind of offense we're going to look at. Here's what's, very here's what's very peculiar about this whole deal. So I remember um, I had, I had Saban a couple of months ago and before I started with him, I was just sitting there chatting. O'Brien had just been hired. They had just made it public. Mm -hmm. And I said, I heard, cause he went off on someone a couple of days prior. And I said, man, I love, I love what you did the other day. He said, what are you talking about? <laughs> I said, man, when they, when they ask you about, the new kind of offense you were going to have here. And so then he starts to laugh. He said, man, let me tell you something. I can do it one of two ways. You tell me, he said, you tell me what you do. I could either have a proven process, an entire organization that speaks the mm -hmm. same language and then change all that because one guy walks in, or I can have the proven process, an entire organization that speaks the language, bring one guy in and have him learn our language. Yeah. We're not bringing an offense in. We're bringing a guy in to run our offense. And so I don't know, really, aside from, you know, some, some bells and whistles here and there, I don't know that their offense is going to look all that much different this year than it had in years past. Yeah, no, it, it didn't in the spring game. I mean, they were lining up in 12 personnel, and, and they were pretty, in my opinion, base, like a lot of teams are, because you're trying to take 13 practices worth of install and, and throw it into one game, and, and you don't want to do too much and, and show too much. Uh, but, but I agree. I, I think what you'll see – 
I think they're going to attack the wide side of the field a little bit more. And you saw that Alabama's always – Saban loves running the comeback on third and eight, third and ten, uh, trying to go trips and get you in one-on-one situations and, and throw the comeback. He's always done that. Uh, but watching their offense, I, I think Bryce Young's ability to run, obviously you have to account for it on defense. And I just wonder if you're going to see more RPOs and then you go back to, you know, well, Bill O'Brien's not a huge RPO guy, even though it is making its way through the NFL. I just wonder, do you think Bryce Young's a guy that could sit there as a pocket passer and pick people apart? Because I think it's unfair, Josh, and I think you'll agree with me, to expect the same output with the personnel that Bryce Young has around him. Uh, new guys on the offensive line, obviously new guys at receiver. You lose Miller Forrest all because last year was just historic for Alabama. That's an unfair comparison, but they don't have to do that to win a national championship. No, you're right about that. I think the, the entire concept of the moving pocket, the designed moving pocket will be a <laughs> thing again there, whereas it wasn't yeah. last year. Um, I don't know that they're going to have to match the offensive production because I think defensive production is going to be a noticeably different level for them this year. But I would suggest this. When we watched that spring game, I'll tell you what stood out to me was a guy like Adji, a, a GA Hall making plays. And so he's going to be a breakout true freshman. And, you know, you got Mechie who's not playing, but there are so many potential breakout guys like Jojo Earl, Christian Leary, Ja'Cory Brooks, all yeah. four and five star guys that weren't even on the field for him Saturday. This is the biggest detachment I have, as I've noticed, from some of the coverage I saw. I saw some people not just suggesting receiver is no longer a strength for Bama, but maybe even a little <laughs> bit of a question for him. I, I'm telling you, dude, I would bank on them having a top five, top six receiver room at the minimum this fall. Yeah. Yeah. They've uh, look at the way they've recruited. I mean, again, when you stack talent on top of talent, it's about efficiency. The likelihood of all those guys busting are not being as good as what uh, they were projected to be. It's very, very low. And then there'll be some guys that surprise you. I mean, there's always some guys that have high accolades that end up not turning into what they think. But when you've been able to stack it and you have that culture where you know all those guys are working, everybody, you know, that respect level they have over there and, and really, you know, the tradition they've built up. And look, anybody that sleeps on Alabama, you're crazy, in my opinion. It's the same thing pretty much every year. Now, there's different levels of dominance. Will they dominate the way that they did last year? I don't think so. I do think the defense will be better. And I laughed at – and, again, I understand the standard that Alabama fans have on defense, but the game's changed so much. I mean, people get mad at Pete Golding for giving up 19 points a game. That's really good. Any head coach in the world will take giving up 19 points a game. Like, that's – in today's game, that is stellar, Josh. Look, I here's all I can tell you, and I don't mean to name drop, but I'm absolutely going to. Let me go back to that same conversation I was talking about, because once again, before we started that interview, I was talking to Saban about Golding. Let me just put it this way. There was zero thought in moving on from Pete Golding. Yeah. There, is, there is zero hesitation in the guy who runs the program up there thinking he's got the right man running the defense. Now, it's his defense but running his defense. And so I listen, it's, you're supposed to have a harder time, the older you get evolving with stuff. And he's obviously the antithesis of that. He's evolved on it way quicker than a lot of the fan base has because he understands how to interpret 19 points per game. Cause he, he understands the concept of complementary football mm -hmm. and what they're doing complements the team. And I don't know how you argue with a national title blows my mind. How in the world you argue with it, but yet, <laughs> Some people still have. So, so I say all that to say this, this should be the best year Pete Golding's had there. Yeah, I agree. And uh, at the end of the day, women lie, men lie, numbers don't lie. Uh, I, I guarantee you Florida fans would have given anything to give up 19 yeah. points a game last year. Uh, and, and everybody, what every fan base would. I mean, Texas A&M's obviously made huge strides. And, and before we get to this new uh, game I'm doing, Josh, every now and then called Quick Trigger, uh, I do got to ask, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about Texas A&M. Uh, and LSU real quick. Uh, to me, I love what Max Johnson brings at LSU. I like what Jake Peets uh, has brought in as well. They had their spring game, and it looked a lot more Joe Brady-esque, and I love how that's a thing now. Even Ed Orgeron said they're getting back to Joe Brady's offense. I'm sure Jake Peets would disagree with you that's exactly Joe Brady's offense, but you saw a lot of the same things. We saw the motion. We saw the multiple formations. Uh, we saw the intricacy of, of – uh, the route tree and, and kind of understanding spacing and, and really utilizing uh, the open space uh, as Joe Brady did when he was the pass game coordinator. Yeah. I had you on mute for a second. I was trying to shake up a protein shake. You understand. Oh, how it's it is. All, oh yeah. Listen, man, get your soldier on. So 
let me let me just put this out there. The concept that they are again running the Joe Brady offense. Pete <laughs> shouldn't push back on that one bit. Joe Brady may get a little miffed by it. Pete should embrace that, okay? Because that's a that's a compliment on his resume. But having said that, I don't I watched that spring game. I watched it about a time and a half, and I am not quite sure still what to expect from them, only because we've seen this. This is not exclusive to LSU. When you tilt a lot of these spring games, 75-25 pass run, which is not indicative at all of what your play calling balance would be in a regular season, Mm -hmm. I don't know how to judge offensive lines. Georgia's was the same way the other day. Bama's, LSU, I mean, they were giving up shocker. They were giving up more pressure on the quarterback when defensive linemen knew what to expect about seven or eight times out of ten. And so, like, I saw LSU's offensive line struggle a little bit. And that's been a talking point down there. It's not unique to the spring game. And it's going to be going into the season. But I wonder, like, is that is that really going to be as big a concern as it looked like it was the other day? Mm-hmm. Kayshawn Boutte, for sure breakout number one level receiver in the SEC. Behind him, they got a lot of names. Names are not depth. Names are names. They don't have proven depth there. And my point is, to run, quote unquote, the Joe Brady offense, or to put up comparable production or anywhere in the neighborhood of that kind of production, you got to have the players. Yes. And I just wonder if they got the players. True. Like, that's, yeah. that's what I wonder. I'm not even talking about the defense, which was extremely porous last year. They've made changes there. Like, they're trying to put as much 2019 on that roster and coaching staff as they possibly can. But I'm not even – my point in all this is I didn't watch that spring game even worried about system or scheme. It's, it's great if that's the lens someone chose to view it through. I just wanted to see, are they going to have the players? Not everyone – no one's 100% mm-hmm. in spring games, but are they going to have the players? And so outside of scheme and system, which we'll talk about all summer, that's what I still have a big blank on in my mind. Like they're a really good roster now. This is relatively speaking. This is relative to trying to contend for a title. They're a very good roster. Uh, but I wonder, man, there's, you know, that gap between nine wins and 10 wins, 11 wins. Like yeah. that's a, that's a, that's one or two superstar players. And mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know that they have a plethora of those kind of guys. Yeah, and, and look, you you, ne- you never know until they turn the lights on, especially when you have turnover. Uh, we all know the turnover that LSU had last year. Uh, I just – I find it – and I agree with you 100%, Josh. You know, it's you can win championships by having the best players and an average scheme, but you're not going to win a championship with having the best scheme and average players. You're not. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, you can have the greatest coaches of all time, but you got to have the players. And Joe Burrow, again – you know, not walking through that door, Jamar Chase, not walking through that door, but they do have, they do have names, like you said, but they have to prove themselves. And there's a couple of teams like that around the league. And, uh, you know, A&M real quick, Josh, uh, they had to replace obviously two all SEC guys up front on the offensive line. They returned a ton on defense and what's turned into one of the best defensive units in the SEC. Uh, and they lose Kellen Mond, but I'm a firm believer in, in, that's not a death knell for Texas A&M, especially when you see what they return uh, at the skill position. At receiver, uh, they do bring a couple guys back, and we all know what Damian Craig was able to do with that receiver room last year. Do you see Texas A&M kind of keeping the momentum rolling here? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. I, do I was talking to a buddy the other day who swore to me that Kellen Mond was like a 10-pound weight around the ankle of A&M football, and yet the same guy tried to tell me, well, A&M's not going to do anything this year. They lost their quarterback. We got to pick a lane here. We got to pick a lane, people. I mean, you can't be, he can't be the helium balloon and the anchor at the same time. It can't be both things. So I was, I was an admirer of Kellen Mond, model citizen, but I don't think that this is some huge void that even a first year starter at quarterback won't be able to fill. Mm -hmm. Once again, comes down to players around him and all that. I'll tell you this though. There are two places that I could not get information out of this spring. One of them is Ann Arbor, Michigan. And the other one was College Station, Texas. I cannot tell you how hard it's been to get from normally reliable people, mind you, how much information or how much scarcity there's been on information out there. So that's a spring game I'll be watching about as close as any spring game there is. Yeah, I agree. And you look at that quarterback battle, uh, you know, you you got the young guy Stowers, but it really looks like it's going to be between Haynes King uh, and uh, Calzada. For some reason, his last name. Uh, I, I, I struggle with it, uh, but it's going to be interesting to see when's that King we know is the dual threat guy, Calzada, more of the pocket passer. But Jimbo uh, is not going to have a problem at quarterback, typically doesn't. He's, he's one of the best quarterback teachers there is, and he's really hard on him, but it ends up working out. But, Josh, you get to be the inaugural uh, contestant on a new game I'm adding called Quick Trigger. 
uh, it's like a rapid fire game. It's a, I don't have to get into some crazy uh, rule explanations, but I'm just going to hit you with eight questions. Uh, we're going to go decently fast. If you want to expand on the answers, uh, th that's fine. Take your time. Uh, they're mostly one part questions. There's one that I ask you to name a top three, but are you ready to enter the Thunderdome? It's tough to set a standard, but I'll try my best. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Josh Pate, host of Late Kick, 247 Sports. Welcome to the Quick Trigger Thunderdome. Question one, most underrated SEC head football coach? Mark Stoops. Most overrated SEC head football coach? Because of my job, I can't answer that. Okay, that's fine. Top three SEC QBs this year? Oh, my goodness. Um, hey, is there a time limit on this? No, 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 take your time. Oh, there's not? Okay. No, there's not. Entering the season, I'm going to say uh, Daniels. Okay. I'm going to say Bryce Young. Okay. I'm going to say, man, I don't know who's going to win the, the job. The third one's LSU. tough. The third one's tough, Josh. What I was writing well, who's going to win the job? Uh, I'm saying, I say Max Johnson, I think, is going to win it. Okay. I'll, I'll take Brennan so one of us can be right. Okay. I like that. I respect that. Question four Your surprise SEC contender? Missouri. Your surprise SEC pretender? Florida. Like that. Best team outside the SEC? Oklahoma. No, 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 no. After Ohio State, we mean, right? I mean, no, outside the SEC. Give me your best team. Yeah, it's Ohio State. Okay. All right. For the next four years, are you buying Tennessee, South Carolina, or Auburn? All places with new head coaches. It's not going to be Tennessee. It is – it's Auburn. Okay. Eighth question. You can answer or not answer it. Are aliens real? Not until I see one. Okay. There we go. Josh Pate, great job, man. Great job. First time on Quick Trigger. Uh, first time we ever did it. Uh, man, you blasted through it. I knew you would. That's what, that's why I had to make you the inaugural guest on it, man. But uh, Josh, I appreciate you, brother. It's always fun. Tell everybody where they can follow you on social media, uh, where they can find Lake Kick. You, you guys do a fantastic job over there. I appreciate it, first off. Um, secondly, the, the top three questions, those are going to be the worst because someone's going <laughs> to hang up and then realize, oh, I left, I left exactly Nick right. Saban off the best coaches in college football. So, <laughs> yeah, but aside from that, 24-7 um, Sports, YouTube channel is where you can find the late kick, uh, the visual element, the late kick podcast. You can find wherever you get your pods and you can follow me on social and get everything at late kick, Josh, Twitter, Instagram, man, take an Instagram seriously finally. And it's, uh, it's paying off. So I like it over there. Nice. nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm really kind of figuring it out too, to be honest. The one I can't figure out is not that I can't figure it out, but I'm just not that well-schooled and, and really enjoys LinkedIn, man. I just can't, for some reason, I, I don't know. They just send me a bunch of stuff that I don't want, but I'm, I'm navigating my way through that. But Josh, brother, I appreciate you. It's always fun. Uh, Got to do this again soon. Uh, make sure you guys check him out over at, at the Late Kick on YouTube, everywhere he just mentioned. It's been another edition of the J-Boy Show. J-Boy's going, going, gone. The J-Boy Show is produced by David Cohn, Technical Director Dave Hammock, Creative Director David Culbertson, Audio Engineer Faison Sharif, Production Assistants Blaine Crane and Kyle Orr, Executive Producers Jake Crane, Vince Thompson, Steve Chamberlain, and David Cohn. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, thejboyshow.com, for updates regarding our newest apparel and merch designs. Win the water cooler with The J-Boy Show.